Hi, everybody. It's Tori Townley. Welcome to the Serve Brew. Hope you guys are having a great day and that you're ready to enjoy some afternoon coffee or morning coffee or whatever your uh, time of day you're listening to this. Today is going to be all guest has the most beautiful mug. All you audio listeners, you don't get to see it. Um, today is going to be so much fun. I'm really excited. We have an incredibly special guest um, named Helen Taylor from Exodus Cry. Hi, Helen. Hi, so good to speak with you today, Tori. Thanks for having me on. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm stoked. I got to give a shout out to Louise because Louise Harvey, she is at the DC Dream Center and introduced us. She's so great. And I'm kind of fangirling. Exodus Cry is a big deal. Um, If you haven't heard of it, Helen is going to tell us all about it today, but the heart of it is to eradicate human trafficking. Um, And that comes in many different ways, many different veins. And it's also, um, Helen is here to encourage us those of us who have a passion for it, those of us who aren't even very familiar with that work, she's going to educate us a little bit and tell us about the beautiful things Exodus Cry is doing. Um, Fun fact, the first time I ever heard of you guys, Helen, was actually through Elevation Church. All their partners, they always feature and post. And I was like, ooh, Exodus Cry, they do like really edgy, cool stuff. Who are these guys? And then here you are. So welcome to the podcast. Oh, and I went to university with Louise um, and but I've been tracking with the work of the, the Dream Center and the different um, chapters for many years. And actually, when uh, you invited me to come on this podcast, a staff member of mine told me that it was through the LA Dream Center that he years ago first heard of the idea of doing outreach to women in prostitution through giving out roses. And he said that that was like for him one of the first um, times the the seed was sown of uh, feeling passionate about outreach. So it's just a really cool and full circle moment of finally connecting more intentionally with the Dream Center. So that is so wild. God is crazy. All the little dots connect. I, I love that. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. Okay. So before we jump into Exodus Cry, I always have the icebreaker question. What is your coffee of choice? Yes. Well, I would say either a vanilla latte or a, a flat white, always hot. I don't know if it's a British thing, but we don't like a lot of ice in our drinks. And that's been a bit of a cultural adjustment to come to the States and be given a cup that's like full of ice. So I always, um, I get hot drinks. And if I ever get cold drinks, I have to ask for no ice. Or sometimes I just say, could I get maybe two ice cubes? And they look at me like, you're a little special. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, but yeah, so that's my coffee of choice. I don't have an espresso machine or anything fancy like that. Just a, a regular drip coffee um, that I can sip during the day. I'm with you on the no cold drinks. It'll be like 80, 90 degrees here. I'm like, please hot, all the hot things. It's just not coffee. Otherwise, yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, so Helen, let us get to know you a little bit. Give us a little background on you personally, like where you're from how you got here, just a little snapshot. Yeah, sure, well, as you can probably tell from the accent, I'm from across the pond. Um, So grew up in London, England, and uh, moved to the States eight years ago, specifically to work for Exodus Cry, and got my green card a couple of years ago. It was really funny, it arrived on St. Patrick's Day, and I was wearing a green dress, and I had green jewelry and green makeup on, literally about to leave the house to go to this St. Patrick's Day party, and my green card arrived in the mail. Um, and I used to work for a, uh, a like long-term aftercare program for trafficked women in Cambodia as an art therapist. Um, so that was my sort of first introduction into the, the world of um, anti-trafficking through uh, therapy and restoration work. But even while I lived in Cambodia doing that, my heart was always still so drawn to the, the women still in the brothels and who are still caught in exploitation and so, um, yeah, I think for a lot of people, it, it sometimes takes getting involved in a few different areas of this work before you really find your lane or your arena where your heart comes alive in it. Um, but I've, I've done this work in 10 different countries now uh, around the world, had the honor of doing outreach or training people in outreach in red light districts um, around the world. And I'm still on fire for this work and for Jesus. And that feels like a testimony in itself with it being one of, you know, the most dark traumatizing topics on the planet. Um, But I just 
really believe God's calling his friends into responding to this work. So that, that's a little bit about how I how I got to America. Um, wow, you are extraordinary. Like I knew a little tiny bit of your story, but that that is amazing. Just the work that you've done and that's some wild stuff. It's so cool. You have a very special calling on your life. That's amazing. Um, I would love to, so I know a lot of us have probably heard a lot about trafficking in certain ways, but if you could, you have experienced so much, you've seen so much, you do so much, give us a picture of just like how this affects people's lives, maybe in ways that we don't even really know about on the surface, or maybe it's not talked about. Give us like a picture of the big need and like why you do what you do. Then we'll jump into exactly what it is that you do. Um, if that makes sense, start with the need. No, definitely. Well, I think people talk about you know, the issue of human trafficking. And of course that also includes labor trafficking and domestic servitudes. There's, there's actually 25 different types of trafficking. Um, most people, when they hear human trafficking, they think of sex trafficking. And that's actually specifically what Exodus Cry focuses on, which um, I know some organizations do both. In my opinion, they're very two very different types of exploitation with different, um, different demand, different solutions, different legislative um, answers required. And um, yeah, we, we've we decided um, just from our, our years of research that looking into this, what, what women and children are trafficked into is, is the sex trade, is prostitution. And so we just feel like you can't talk about sex trafficking without talking about prostitution or the commercial sex, sex industry, the very industry that people are trafficked into. Um, and a lot of people, I think, um, are more familiar with like the, um, so, so to prove legally, for someone to be legally classified as a victim of trafficking, they're either under 18 in the commercial sex industry, like consent doesn't have to be um, even verified one way or the other. If there's a 15 or 16 year old in prostitution, they are automatically classified as a child, a minor, a victim of trafficking. If they're over 18, um, then legally, uh, an element of fraud, force, or coercion has to be present for them to be um, labeled as a trafficking victim. And most people, I think, think of the force element, like the kidnapping, the, um, the, the chains, the ropes, the van, the, the more dramatic physical force element of the, the kidnapping extraction, the force. Um, whereas the vast majority of sex trafficking doesn't actually um, that that isn't the initial entry point into prostitution, into sex trafficking. It's the fraud and the coercion that pimps and traffickers know is actually a lot more effective for keeping their victims from running away. If they can brainwash them, if they can groom them, if they can um, trauma bond with them so that they're, the person that they are exploiting uh, sees them as their master and will never um, try and run away. And so I think a question that even years into this we still get is, you know, she was, she had a car, she was free to drive around and leave. Like, how could she be a trafficking victim if she clearly looks like free from the outside? And um, what we're really passionate about people understanding more and more is the coercive um, fraudulent elements present in trafficking and the psychological coercions that pimps and traffickers use that is so dark. And I actually read a couple of books written by pimps. I couldn't believe they got published. They're basically a how to be a pimp guide one of them got published by a major publishing company you can buy it at barnes and noble and it's called well it, it outlines all the different um psychological manipulation techniques of how to um recruit girls to be in prostitution and you take their money every night um so i'd say obviously there's a lot more i could share about that but i just think it's really important for people to enter this conversation with an open mind or even just acknowledging that what they, the picture they have in their mind about human trafficking may not be what it actually looks like in everyday life, which is why so many cases still go on unidentified because um, people um, think that trafficking looks like this very narrow um, definition when it's actually a lot broader than that. Wow, Helen, this is like pretty mind blowing. Like just you've educated us so much already on just what to look for. It's crazy how it is so, I hate to say subtle, but it is. And that's, I feel like we hear these staggering numbers and a lot of times it's like, well, where, where is that? Like that's half, like, oh my gosh, but it's right under our noses sometimes. Like I, I know that I've seen 
things happening. I'm like, that feels a little off, but it doesn't seem off. What's going on? And it, it blows my mind. Like you said, that the psychological part, it's very complex stuff. And so it makes me so thankful for people like you who have put in the work to kind of unravel this and identify the patterns and figure out the practical solutions to be able to help. So with that, and I'm sure there's so many deep questions. All my listeners are probably like, Tori, why didn't you ask this question or that question? Because there's so many things to learn from your knowledge. It's crazy. Um, But we'll get to that. I want to know, tell us about, based on all of these needs and these things that you've studied and learned, the vision of Exodus Cry and like how it got started, some of the history, and then like we'll move into what what it is that you guys do and how you practically help with, with this crazy, awful stuff that people are going through. How do you bring hope? Yeah, no, thanks so much for, for asking and um, allowing me to share. So uh, our founder was really awakened to the issue of trafficking um, back in 2007. And at the time he was just leading a series of, of prayer meetings and just felt so compelled to um, share about the reality of trafficking with those people in these prayer meetings. And over a series of time, um, I think for him, he really came into this with the understanding that this is is a spiritual and really dark component, an evil component to sex trafficking. And, um, you know, all of us on staff are are Christians and um, we really believe that it's the, the compassion and justice of Jesus that compels all our work. And that when he announced his mission in Luke 4, quoting Isaiah 61, um, you know, he, the spirit of the sovereign Lord has anointed him uh, to preach the good news, to bring liberty to the captives, proclaim freedom um, for the prisoners and um, bind up the brokenhearted, declare a year of jubilee. Like that out of every scripture in the whole, whole of the Old Testament that Jesus chose to announce in that infamous um, instance in Luke 4, the fact that he declared that about himself. I, I've always seen Jesus as, as the ultimate abolitionist and freedom and justice is, you know, righteousness and justice are at the foundations of God's throne, right? This is so such important work to him and it isn't this social justice issue to the side um, that's different from the good news of, of Jesus and his message. Like it's absolutely integral and a key part of bringing the kingdom of God to earth and light overcoming darkness and so with that um, someone a few months after this series of prayer meetings um, just approached my boss with ten thousand dollars and said I really believe you were meant to start a non-profit to start fighting trafficking and he wasn't really on his radar to do that Um, but with that money his background was in filmmaking so he began a a trip that eventually turned into a documentary called Nefarious Merchant of Souls that's um, free to watch on YouTube and it's a global look, a global expose of the sex trade worldwide. And it analyzes it in several different countries. What are some of the, the real key issues and what are some of the solutions? And really finishes with several survivors just sharing their testimonies of freedom. So um, we decided, um, I, I jumped on board uh, eight and a half years ago. Um, but I would say our, our mission is really in the spirit of William Wilberforce and how he abolished the transatlantic slave trade, a system that was so built into the mindset and the culture at the time. And he and his a Cla- the Clapham sect and the people in his small community were absolutely obsessed with um, the fact that the slave trade was the most evil, corrupt system and that it wasn't okay on their watch um, for it to continue. So. Um, In the spirit of Wilberforce, we um, are working to shift culture, change mindsets. So through films, documentaries, stories, telling the stories, really humanizing the people who are most caught and affected in this and um, inspiring change from those stories, shifting the culture, going after the deeper roots and then legal reform. So abolition, what are the the most holistic, redemptive, strategic, victim-centered laws on the planet that best fight trafficking and how do we see every nation pass these laws so I can share a bit about that in a minute Um, and then our other sides we have yeah the legal reform and cultural reform on one side and the other side is reaching victims going to wherever the sex industry exists and um, being that uh, voice of hope and love coming alongside those in the sex industry um, 
empowering them, building relationship with them. So we have teams every week um, going to the streets, strip clubs, um, sometimes Asian massage parlors, um, if there's exploitation happening there, um, uh, jail program, and then reaching women sold for sex on the internet. So the different websites where they're listed and advertised for sex. Um, we always think if the sex buyers can find the women, then so can we. And so we developed a whole training manual on all these different types of outreach and how to effectively reach people being exploited for sex in your community. And then we connect them with all the most um, relevant and accessible, helpful resources in the city that they might need um, and partner with some other organizations that are providing the long-term aftercare, which we used to do that as well. And just decided that to best focus on our mission we shouldn't focus on every single lane, but narrow it down to a few key lanes. So that's kind of our mission. Our mission is to abolish sex trafficking. And um, yeah, that that is kind of how we're trying to do that. <laughs> that is huge. My brain is going a million miles an hour. Like it is so thorough, the, the, just the coverage that you guys have, the knowledge, the history is beautiful, how this all got started. And I love that it's all rooted in the scriptures that you shared and it is about setting people free and to me sometimes it can be a very intimidating type of ministry like just oh gosh I wouldn't even know how to help that's terrifying it's just it's edgy it's it's scary but when you bring it back down to like it's people like Jesus loves people and whatever it takes to help get them free like it's 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 not simple, but it just brings you back down to that that heart and that um, just anchoring down in the roots of Jesus has this on his heart all the time. So then, yeah, wow, my mind is blown as you can tell. Um, yeah, so let's go this way. So you've just shared such a broad picture. You guys touch in so many different areas. What would you say to our churches out there, our dream centers, our people who are looking to get involved? What are some practical ways that maybe they can get involved with you guys? Obviously, y'all are doing a lot. There's lots of partnership opportunities. What are some of those things? Um, yeah, just how can they get involved in this beautiful work? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I think this is such a, it's a multifaceted issue. We need people in every sector of society using their um, influence and role to um, bring an end to this. Like I truly believe this is the, the biggest assault on the, the image of God in a man or a woman on the planet. It's the greatest evil. I've never come across something that is more um, traumatizing and evil and um, uh, le like victims of prostitution are left with uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, same level as frontline war veterans. And it's, um, it is a system that we are challenging and wanting to completely overturn um, as a system of violence and inequality against women. Um, so I'd say um, a real key first step is educating yourself. And our, as I said, our film Nefarious, it's free to watch on YouTube. We have a lot of other smaller educational videos that are like two or three minutes long that just expose some of the myths and some real like um, tight and uh, informative educational videos that I'd really recommend people watch we have another film called liberated the new sexual revolution that's on netflix and um, we're about to come out with a, a new film um, in the next month and our social media is is at exodus cry and um yeah i really think that it would be you know the church is god's plan a to bring justice to the world and this is something that there's so many different issues um i, I don't feel like it's just you know one issue that certain people are uh, a, a call to respond to even though obviously some people have a more long-term calling for this work but this is something that everyone in the body of Christ can get involved with to some degree and so yeah track with our work um, and educate yourself I'd say um, the book on the life of Wilberforce Amazing Grace by Eric Metaxas is a really powerful biography um, the, the survivor memoir, memoir I would recommend is called Paid For by Rachel Moran, and that's M-O-R-A-N, and she is a survivor of prostitution from Ireland, and um, it's, it's a really hard and intense, heavy read, full disclaimer, um, but such an important book. Um, I know for me, when I first found out um, really about the, the severity of global sex trafficking back in 2007, 8 kind of time, 
the first thing I did was spend about a year researching as much as I could and just praying for this issue. And really some of those prayers were just very much like, God, I'm available, like, please use me to help be the answer in some way. Please put me in a position where I could help someone um, who's ever in that situation and just keeping my heart positioned and opened to however the Lord might open those doors. And so when he did, I really knew that it was him opening those doors um, and I and I walked through them. But yeah, we, I mean, do you want me to share about some of our campaigns that we're currently doing that people could get involved with? Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, so about just over a year ago, well, actually, let me go backtrack a little more. So one of the things that we're really passionate about, if you picture a tree, um, individual victims um, being like rescued from sex trafficking um, could indicate, you know, like fruit on a tree. And we just believe that um, by removing those individual fruit and getting them into to safety or um, even cutting off a branch where a pimp or trafficker is arrested and a huge number of people being exploited are, um, are offered assistance, that doesn't in the big picture long-term solve the problem of trafficking. And so we have to look at what is the trunk of this tree. You could call this tree the exploitation tree. This trunk is a system, the commercial sex industry that people are trafficked into. And what supports this trunk? What is at the root? Well, the root is um, male demand for sex that thrives in the soil of pornographic culture. And so you could sum it up in this one line, if, if every man stopped purchasing sex today, sex trafficking would end today. Um, and obviously that's not necessarily uh, a fully realistic um, goal for that to happen today, but the premise lies that um, it's a supply and demand issue, right? So if you're wanting to decrease supply, you have to look at who is the demand, where is the demand coming from, and how do we in the long term, say even like a 10 year goal, um, really aggressively go after the root. And the largest study on sex buyers ever done was, has identified that um, the number one deterrent from men buying sex is harsher criminal penalties. So a few weeks ago, Texas became the very first state in America to make sex buying a felony. Um, in all other 49 states, it's still currently a misdemeanor. And we um, have been really inspired by the example of some of these, um, about seven other countries have passed this law called the Nordic model, the abolition model, sometimes called the equality model. And Sweden was the first country to pass this 22 years ago. And other countries that passed it are um, Iceland, Ireland, France, um, Canada, Israel, uh, Norway. And what this law basically does, and if anyone remembers anything from this podcast, um, like try and wrap your head around this law, because this is the law that we really believe will be what abolishes sex trafficking long term. So it um, heavily criminalizes um, sex buyers, so it would be a felony level offence uh, with warranted jail time, um, a very serious violent crime, and then heavily goes after tra uh, traffickers and pimps, increases their, their penalties, and really um, empowers and equips the police force to um, go after um, all third parties. And at the same time, it decriminalizes people in prostitution. So um, instead of putting a, a vulnerable woman in jail for prostitution, um, because a lot of people don't self-identify as trafficking victims and they get arrested and they have a criminal record when they're actually a victim. And we would never think of criminalizing victims of domestic violence. Um, and we see this as the same thing. They are a victim of a system of violence and inequality. So by decriminalizing people in prostitution, giving them robust wraparound services instead, you actually um, help women exit or people exit and you heavily go after the root. And what this has done in Sweden in 22 years has dramatically shifted the cultural mindsets around prostitution. And the, the chief police of the prostitution unit in Sweden, I've heard him say that in Sweden, young men grow up and they understand it is a human rights violation to purchase someone's sexual consent. You were purchasing access to the body of a vulnerable, marginalized person who's either in survival mode, they're desperate, they're a single mom, or they, they are one of the most vulnerable people in society, they're not doing this by choice, um, or they are under the, uh, the control of a third party, a pimp or a trafficker. Um, so, so men in Sweden have the mindset that um, 
for relationships to be mutual, for agency to be there, um, money cannot be involved. As soon as you introduce money, you introduce coercion and money is the evidence of coercion. She doesn't desire the sex, she desires the money or the pimp does, but we have to um, start understanding and framing this whole issue of never mind all the intricacies of how she was trafficked and her level of consent, instead of even breaking that down because consent can be coerced, the very fact that money is present in a sexual exchange is problematic. Let's start there and then address all the violence in prostitution, how to best provide exit services for the women and how to um, effectively go after the, the sex buyers. Um, so that, yeah, as I said, it's called the Nordic model, the abolition model. Um, there's a handful of states that are looking to try and pass that. Uh, we also have a very aggressive lobby that's wanting to fully decriminalize prostitution. So that's why it's a little bit confusing for some folks that they kind of hear, you know, are, are you trying to legalize prostitution like in um, Nevada or Germany? Like, no, we're not trying to legalize prostitution. Um, and countries that have done that, like Amsterdam in the Netherlands or Germany, have actually seen an exponential increase of trafficking and the normalization of demand. We're now up to one in five, one in five men in Germany buy sex on a regular basis. And, um, and there's drive-through brothels, there's mega brothels, like it's ingrained into the culture. So comparing Germany and then nations like Sweden and Canada and France, um, it's sending the, the, these different nations in very different trajectories legislation-wise. So I know that was a lot. <laughs> um, just, I think it's so important to help educate people on why this is so important. And we can't talk about sex trafficking without talking about laws and, and sex buyers. Wow, Helen. Again, mind blown. This is crazy stuff. Um, I love the idea of getting to the root of it. I've That's crossed my mind before. It's like there's not a whole lot of talk about the demand and like reaching out to the men. And um, I, I definitely, that, it makes me wonder if you were to I'm just sorry, my head is spinning in beautiful ways. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering if you were to boil that down to, let's zoom into like, say I have a church listening today who is in a maybe a rural community, not even like a big city where it's like, oh yeah, Red Lake District, we know what that's about. But it's like, I, I want to know how do I make in a difference? Because clearly it is pretty present. Would you say in most communities it's happening in some way or another? Okay, so how do I as a church respond? Obviously, in getting involved, like you said, education is huge and prayer, like that blows my mind how that's where your heart started and God got you to like be literally globally helping people in massive ways. Um, but also, where does your mind go for someone who's like, I kind of just want to tap into it. I've got a little bit of education. I feel like I'm being led to take the next step. Would you lead someone to like, is it a, we need to train young men on just how to be gentlemen. Like I've seen a group do that before. Like we do a gentleman training and yay, yay, yay. I know it's more than that, but what are some steps that churches can take, even if it's a strip club, Rose giveaway, What? where do you go next? Uh, it's, it's so good. And I think I would say like to any person who's that question is burning in their heart, like firstly, Go to the Lord with that question and really start to dialogue with him because um, there isn't just one size fits all. It's very much God will use your own giftings and creativity and, um, and skills and influence where, where you're at. So start with where you're at and, you know, what your sphere of influence is. Um, watch our film gather a group of people to watch it together and start with a prayer meeting and start asking those questions of, Lord, how can we be, be part of this solution in our communities? Um, for any man that's interested in, the, in that question, so we always have guys on all of our outreach teams and there's also a really fantastic um, outreach model to sex buyers through cyber patrols that, that guys in any community can be part of. Um, and so that is um, a, a really fantastic group the EPIC project, EPIK, and it's a group of men um, who do these cyber patrols, who reach out to other sex buyers, um, who intercept phone calls and just educate them on the reality that this is a, um, a criminal offence, but really trying to compassionately reach their hearts um, and find out what's led them in their life to the, to the moment where they are purchasing another human for sex and what you know addiction resources can they give them, um, who can they plug them 
in with or how can they even just start to talk to these guys on the phone and help them understand what they're getting involved in. Um, wherever the sex industry exists in your community, like some, some cities have streets called prostitution tracks where the women are out um, or strip clubs or Asian massage parlors. Some, some areas don't have any of that in obvious places. Um, and so, uh, as I said earlier, we, like, we developed a whole training on how to reach women over the internet um, and meet them in places. So that's, uh, we, we have um, this, this uh, outreach manual that on our website you can look into and see if, if that might be a good starting place. Um, but yeah, we, something uh, else I'd always encourage people is, you know, if you're a, if you're a teacher, um, like, or, or you work for, a, for an airline or you're in the medical community or the legal community, or you're in construction or whoever the people you are around, you can begin to be salt and light and a cultural influence. Even shifting that, you know, at the, at the root of this exploitation tree is porn culture. So by shifting the, um, the culture in your own communities and kind of bringing that back to, um, we've been talking about the root and something that I discovered early on when I was living in Cambodia and one girl that I was working with, she'd been trafficked from a rural village from the age of 11 into a main city in Cambodia in brothels um, trafficked her whole teenage life. And she told me that Western men would bring um, videos on their tablets or phones of pornography and show her these videos and get her to, to copy what she um, was shown. That was the very first time I made the connection between pornography and trafficking. And since then, we have begun to really expose all the intersections between trafficking and porn from the point of um, real trafficking victims are often filmed and videoed by their pimps or buyers and those videos are uploaded onto sites like some of the biggest most mainstream porn sites in the whole world. Um, people are also trafficked into the porn industry, they're coerced, they're forced into contracts or they show up thinking that they're going to be doing a modeling photo shoot and they are abused on, on, on set and those videos end up on the internet and people watching them think that it's some like rich paid porn star and it's actually a girl who showed up thinking she was doing a modeling shoot who was coerced on this uh, at the time. Um, we also just see how it's the sex buyers don't just start with the decision to buy a per person for sex, they have a long-standing porn addiction um, and so the porn industry is the marketing force of sex trafficking, it's fueling it, it's behind it and so just over a year ago we started a petition um, to call for the shutting down of, of the world's largest pornography site because we had numerous cases of trafficking victims being on that site. And we realized that the site didn't verify age or consent on any video. So this website literally had no idea how many thousands of potential underage victims or trafficking or rape victims were on their site. And so by the end of the year, um, this the campaign ended up, it's called Trafficking Hub, ended up getting becoming a global um, widespread movement um, the petition was signed in 192 different countries, and it was on the front page of the New York Times, which uh, forced the credit card companies to all pull ties with this porn site once it was exposed, the level of com complicity with trafficking. And this website removed 10 million videos because all of their unverified content they removed because they knew that they had no idea how many potential trafficking victims are on their site. And so that whole case is still unfolding. There's been um, dozens of victims who are suing this site and are opening other civil cases, litigations, um, class action lawsuits. So we, you know, we, we're wanting to go after the root, which includes demand, which includes pornography, um, which includes these individual websites, but also um, our next whole campaign is actually focusing on protecting children from accessing porn sites and exposing all of the, the harms to the, the minds of um, children when they're exposed to this really violent adult content. And the average age of exposure to porn is between eight and 11. It's getting younger and younger all the time as child exposure to, um, to, to phones, to computers and devices. And a lot of parents have no idea how to properly filter some of these sites and literally an eight-year-old is two clicks away from getting on um, the porn site that I mentioned that we've been aggressively going after that doesn't verify consent or age. So we've had hundreds of stories coming in the last few months to our organization um, just telling us about the, um, just the trauma and harms to their kids um, that, the, that pornography has done 
and we're demanding regulation and um, age verification. We're saying if big tobacco and alcohol companies aren't allowed to market or freely offer cigarettes and vodka to elementary age school kids, then pornography websites shouldn't be allowed to have eight year olds easily accessing. Um, so we're, we're going after this issue from multiple angles. Um, I feel like you know petitions and grassroots support from, from people is what really helped that last movement to take off. It was the voices of the people. This isn't about just one organization's work. It's about communities, organizations, um, different sectors in society um, joining their voices together. Um, and that's what creates these really effective global campaigns that bring about change. Wow. Wow. I know it's a lot. It's like when I'm so passionate about this topic, it all flows out like a river. <laughs> no, and that's beautiful to me because it, it, I'm sitting here thinking like, first of all, you guys are moving mountains. Like this is big deal stuff, big, big, like just foundational type of influence that you guys have. And it also makes me thankful because you're an expert that we can learn from, we can come to. Um, you've done a lot of hard work. And so we just like honor you in that and being able to like kind of build that bridge for people who are not super in the know, but really have a heart for Jesus. Like you have been such a big bridge builder, even just in the couple weeks or months that I've known you, like this is such a gift to be able to lean into that. And yeah, I'm sure everybody listening, it's like, if you didn't know that your head is spinning big time, um, but you, Helen and your team, you guys make it, um, I don't even know the word, but you just make it doable to where together we can make a difference together. We really can change people's lives and we really can get rid of this evil. And it, it touches every, like you said, every generation, every gender, like it is, it's prevalent, but it's not going to be anymore. Um, I, I get, I got chills. Like while you were talking about the scripture about Jesus came to set the captives free, like I wasn't like, I've heard that scripture a million billion times, but I heard it in a new way when you said it the way that you said it. And I felt like God was just like, that is, that is so close to my heart. That is so close to my heart. And that is, it's who I am. That's what I came to do. And I want you to be part of that. I want you guys listening to be part of that. Um, so thank you for just the beautiful way that you presented it and the beautiful heart that you have in it. Um, I know you mentioned a lot of trainings. You've sent me links for things. You've mentioned the videos in the book. So we'll make sure that we link to all of that in the show notes. Um, and those trainings, you guys, that she is talking about are very, oh my gosh, I, I didn't like even watch every single thing or read every single thing, but they're so thorough and they're so enlightening and they're so encouraging. Um, it's not daunting. It's very encouraging, very practical. So definitely make sure to check that stuff out. Um, Helen, I, I want to ask you, this is something I love to ask people, but like you obviously have worked with so many different people, so many walks of life, so many countries. Um, I know the work that you do is very um, confidential in a lot of ways, but is there maybe a story that sticks out to you of just somebody that, or it doesn't have to be somebody, it could be just whatever, something that keeps you close to the why, why you do this? Yeah, well, I am... Um... Yeah, something that I, I, I began doing a few years ago, and I don't do this with every woman I, I work with, but um, sometimes if I've met uh, a trafficking victim, whether it's in the US or um, it, around the world, we were in Russia for the World Cup and around major sporting events, we always um, try and do big initiatives and engage the church in, in outreach and prayer. Um, anyway, if, if I meet someone and um, begin walking alongside them into their, their journey of freedom, um, if there's a moment when they are transitioning into a, a program or getting a new job or, or at some kind of precipice moment where they are exiting exploitation um, for the first time, um, or maybe the seventh time, for some people, it, it doesn't take, the, it's more than the first attempt to exit. Um, there's multiple attempts before they are, are successfully out. Um, but I've asked um, the women that I'm working with if I can take them shopping to the mall and buy them a new pair of shoes and in exchange, them give me a pair of their old shoes, like the high heel stilettos, um, because you know modern day victims of trafficking don't have iron shackles around their ankles, but what they do have are their, the high heel stiletto shoes, right? And so it's this kind of beautiful picture of the story of the prodigal son. When he returned, his father gave him um, a cloak, a ring, 
and new shoes. And I really believe that there's something about that that symbolizes like a new chapter, a new walk, a new journey, a new identity. Um, and one day I was at a church and I was sharing this and I had about 10 pairs of the stiletto heels from some of the different women I'd worked with. Um, and it just made it really personal for people to see real shoes um, of real women that have, have come out of this life and celebrating that. And this young man came up to me afterwards and he just said, Helen, I found your talk really difficult to listen to um, because I used to buy women in prostitution out of a severe porn addiction. And I'm sitting here and I've never told this to anyone. And I, the, my, my stomach is sinking because I know that some of those women were trafficked. Like I, I just know. And I am part of the problem. And his voice was shaking and he was like, can I repent to you? Like, can you pray for me to receive God's mercy on my life for what I've done? And I just sat him down and it's really intense. I was a bit like, oh my gosh, Lord, give me your words towards this young man. And I just said, I know that you can't personally meet with and repent to every individual woman you've exploited, but on behalf of someone who works with women, um, like I, I receive your repentance, I receive your apology. And I just began to pray for him. And I had the same picture of the, the parable of the prodigal son, because even the prodigal son was a sex buyer, according to his older brother, right? He squandered his money on that. And when he made that um, return to the father, the heart of the father towards him was to run towards him, embrace him in compassion and to, um, to redeem him from slavery and to return him to sonship. And anyway, so we talked for a while, we prayed for a while. Um, he left the building. And then 10 minutes later, he just came up, just he came back in just as we we're all clearing up and he had his shoes in his hand and was like, Helen, if the women's shoes symbolize their broken shackles of captive set free, um, I need to give you my shoes because I'm leaving here a free man and I never want to walk in these shoes again. And he, I just pointed to the stage. I was like, why don't you put your shoes with the women's? So he put his shoes next to the women's shoes. And, and then he just left the church in his socks um, have no idea what happened to him, but I just felt that that was a really Holy Spirit inspired moment and such a powerful visual picture of the women a victim of one thing. Um, the men essentially are victims of another thing, victims to addiction run by a big porn corrupt um, whole industry that is hell bent on um, addicting men to content that impacts their behavior and leads to sex trafficking. Um, but it was just such, you know, it brought it all back to the, the simple um, for the one message that all of this work is about and um, we that's why I love that we you know we're focusing on global awareness and shifting culture and all these big long-term things um, but really outreach always keeps our hearts connected to the one we're going on a street outreach and if there's one woman we find tonight that we can just um, minister the Lord's love to her and connect with her humanity and value and just speak that into her and be there for her that's what it's essentially all about for us that is it dude that story is so oh my gosh like that's unheard of that's just what a moment what a beautiful moment and that's that's the kind of stories that you're replicating all around the globe and it all boils down to the one i love that so much Oh my gosh, Helen. So, okay. One couple more questions. One is what like closing advice for serve leaders out there? Um, any, any words of encouragement specifically to their hearts? I know you've, you've spoken into our hearts a lot, but just any like closing pieces of advice or um, just that anyone involved in outreach, especially to, um, I don't know, I feel like children, youth in a city uh, at risk, children, like wh whoever you're involved in, in outreach to, it's so important to um, be better educated about um, those who've been maybe impacted by the sex industry, um, trauma. Um, I'd really recommend that, like, it, I mean, obviously organizations that are providing education, but um, reading books by, by um, survivors really is the has been the most educational thing for me. Um, as well as the direct outreach, of course. So I just, I don't, you can't underestimate the importance of listening to those podcasts, reading those books, taking the time to really hear the stories and better understand um, the issue. But you know, even the weekly program we did at a jail, not every woman coming through the program had been trafficked, um, but about 30 to 40% had been in the sex industry at some point or another, even if it was they were found themselves homeless and surviving, um, like literally to survive the streets, that's how they, they survived. And 
Um, so I just think that um, I, I've been asked to speak about trafficking to second graders. And I was like, how on earth do I talk about this topic in an uh, age appropriate way? But I really just you know, simply broke down the whole concept of slavery and exploitation in a way that was relevant to them. And then even talked about some of the apps that they were on and basically saying, anyone is vulnerable to um, being approached by a dangerous person. If you have strangers talking to you online or any apps, and the next day, one of the kids in that class told her teacher, um, I have TikTok and I have like people I don't know talking to me all the time, um, but I, I told my mom that I'm gonna delete it. And I think a lot of parents are just completely blissfully naive, but kind of devastatingly naive um, to the, the risks of, of their kids. And we do highlight all the vulnerable populations that are vulnerable to being trafficked and exploited, but essentially any kid that has a Wi-Fi connection or access to a, um, a smartphone is also vulnerable. So I feel like on the prevention side of things, um, which is, is a part of outreach, right? Um, to really think about who are the vulnerable people that you're connected with and how can you um, like integrate some of these training resources, um, even if it's just for a season, but, but taking on the topic of trafficking or prevention um, or even you know, reaching the women, reaching the buyers, um, getting involved in campaigns, going off to the root and porn. Um, there's so many creative ways that you can st still get involved and even like signing a petition. I know it feels like we all get sent so many petitions, but like the power even of you lending your signature um, to something like that is you become part of a huge campaign and movement that then that becomes 2 million signatures that impacts legislation. And so just don't, don't ever think, or all I can do is sign a petition and read a book, like that's nothing. Um, if, if you start with the small things, your opportunities for more outreach, even as you grow in awareness, for sure will widen. That is so good, Helen. Start start small, it'll grow. Look at, look at what you guys are doing and it, yeah. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I just want to know, you've given us so many resources to learn about this, so many books, podcasts, we'll link to it. Um, but what is fueling you? You are such a beautiful soul. You are so passionate. You are so just like, wow. I would love to know, is there something that you're reading personally or listening to? Um, I love to lean into our heroes. Like what's influencing you? How can we get some of that? Um, anything fun? <laughs> Hmm. I mean, I love to read. I'm always maybe like once a month, I'm trying to read a new um, book related to the, either this work or um, a survivor story. Um, I mean, I think, I think for me, um, I know that this is something I'm called to because I, I consistently still weep about it. And I consistently feel that the fire of anger about it. And I think that if anger becomes the only thing that influences you, then it, that becomes toxic. It can't be the driving force for your work. Um, but so there's a place for both anger and, and compassion and tears. So it's like, follow the tears and follow the fire. <clears throat> and, and, and even um, protect that. So like, I, um, I'm blown away that I get to do this work. There's nothing that I'm more passionate about. Um, but I know that it all started for me with, with really sitting before the Lord and asking him what he's passionate about, what's on his heart. And so cultivating friendship with Jesus is what all of this comes back to. And if you're asking him those questions of like, God, what's on your heart today? Like who are the, the people that you are so desperately in love with that you're wanting to reach? What are the things that are making you really angry today, God? How do I partner with that? And then just feeding and fueling, whether it's different scriptures and um, and I just went away on a, a weekend prayer retreat because sometimes I just have to totally unplug for a couple of days and really dial down and just come back to like the whisper of the Holy Spirit and what, what is at the center of all of this. And it's that Jesus loves people and he wants them to know that they're loved. And the, the message of the Good Samaritan, like how do we um, offer assistance to the people in need? Um, so I know that's kind of a lot and I, I don't really know how to answer that question because it's so multifaceted, but I'm just always wanting God to speak to me about what's on his heart around these issues and how to see them from his perspective. That was the best answer I could have ever imagined. Staying close to Jesus's heart is everything. That is 
Wow. That explains that explains why we're so drawn to your spirit and you're so amazing and beautiful and fueled up and you pour out so much and yet you still shine. That's asking him what's on his heart. I will remember that for a long time. That's like ground shaking. Um, you are such a delight. Thank you so much. You told us how to find you on social media or Exodus cries on social media. Are you on social media as well? Or should we just follow y'all? What's up? Yeah, I, I mean, I joined Instagram last year, Helen.mctaylor, but Exodus cry, like, so just at Exodus cry is our main organization handle. And that's really where we, um, post a lot about updates with, um, the trafficking hub movement and our next comic upcoming campaign um and we're on facebook as well too and youtube and we have a podcast and um, that you can find on spotify or wherever um but probably instagram i feel like is is where most people are even like on as far as social media these days absolutely perfect thank you so much this has been amazing mind-blowing and also really exciting thank you a brilliant interviewer and thanks for asking just all these really important questions and drawing it out of me and um uh, and i know it's it is an overwhelming topic but it's also so important and so near to the little heart so thank you for just taking the time to to ask us about it today no you rock thank you for your time thank you for the work you do you're incredible um all right listeners thank you all so much for tuning in i hope that you all have a great day and we'll see you next time on the surf room bye